what does the Bible actually say about abortion? We hear lots of people yelling their opinions about the Bible and how everybody should live. But that's not necessarily the case of what's in the Bible. There are some things that are often lifted up by the <coughs> religious. And that's first that God has plans for those in the womb. In Judges 16, 17, and I'm going to be reading from the King James Version, for, since that is the most patriarchal, <laughs> to give the argument of those that I'm not reading some modern liberal version of the Bible. I'm going to the words that Jesus spoke in the 16th century. <laughs> in Judges 16, 17, He told her all her heart and said unto her, There has not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarene unto God from my mother's womb. And that's Samson talking to Delilah. And in the Psalms, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. In Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified these, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And these are the scriptures most often cited by those who are against abortion in any form. The rationale is that if God cares about the unborn, then they are equal to the born. Thus the unborn should be considered as persons, and if they are persons, killing them is wrong. But the notion of fetal personhood is undermined by the following passage. In Exodus 21, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. And if any mischief follow, then shall shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So what we have here is an abortion caused by violence against the mother to be. And if the abortion is caused, the woman's husband collects a fine, according to the ruling of a judge. In the strange words in the passage is, if any mischief follows. And this means mischief that's other than harm to the fetus. If she loses a foot, then the perpetrator loses a foot. If she loses a hand, a hand, a tooth, a tooth, an eye, an eye. But if she loses the fruit of her womb, the man has only to pay a fine because there, the man has no fruit for which to exchange. Since only a fine is recovered, we can assume that the Bible does not consider the fruit of the womb a human life, because in this passage it says a life for a life. So fetal personhood is not supported by the Bible. Now, Jeremiah was formed from the womb and called to be a prophet. But Jeremiah himself had a different opinion after he had spent many years preaching to the people of Israel and having them say, we don't like your preaching. <laughs> and he, he wrote in Jeremiah 20, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man-child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontime. Because he slew me not from the womb, 
or that my mother have been my grave, and her womb will be always great with me. Wherefore come I forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days shall be consumed with shame. So what we have here is the prophet Jeremiah himself saying, I wish I had been aborted, and cursed be the man who didn't do it. But the most disturbing references to abortion in the Bible that describe abortion as an act of war. And sometimes it's disapproved by God, as in Amos. Thus saith the Lord for the transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up women with the child of Gilead, and they might enlarge their border. So he's saying, you guys went over and attacked those women and, and to just expand your country. Therefore, you're cursed. But sometimes abortion was ordered by God, as in Hosea 13. Samaria shall become desolate, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, and their infants shall be dashed to pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. This is not a pro-life passage. <laughs> but even more strange is it appears in Numbers 5, that abortion was a holy rite performed by the Hebrew priests. From Numbers 5, beginning at verse 12. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it is hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witnesses against her, and neither she be taken with the manner. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, that he be jealous of his wife, and she not be defiled. Then the man shall bring the priest, wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her and offer a tenth part of Ephra barley meal, and shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthly vessel, and the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, and the priest shall take and put it in the water, and the priest shall set it, the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head, and put the offering of memorial in her hand, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man lain with thee, and thou hast gone, not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causes the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee besides thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people. The Lord does make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And when he has made her drink the water, and it shall come to pass that if she be defiled, and has done trespassed against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter her and become bitter. Her belly shall swell and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. So to recap, cut through some of the V's and thou's. If the husband thinks the woman is pregnant by another man, brings to the priest to drink the bitter water, and it causes her belly to swell up and her thigh to melt away. And thigh is often 
uh, used in the Bible as a euphemism of somewhere where the thighs join. Now she's innocent, nothing happens, and she's able to conceive. But if she's guilty, she has this miscarriage, and it ruins her ability to conceive again. So this is an abortion being performed by the Hebrew priests. And this is what the Bible says about abortion. But in nowhere in the Bible is the abortion initiated by the woman. It is never her choice. It's a choice of a jealous husband. It is the choice of a marauding army. I think the debate is oversimplified. One camp calls itself pro-life and the other calls itself pro-choice, but there's a diversity of options. I mean, if one actually believes that life begins at conception, then there can be no exceptions. Abortion is murder, and rape and incest is not a justification for murder. If a woman kills her rapist after the rape is committed, she will be charged with murder. But what is the other consequences of life beginning at conception? Can a woman take a tax deduction the moment she is pregnant? Heavy menstruation might be a sign that a fertilized egg did not successfully implant on the uterine wall. Should a funeral be held? I saw recently that a woman tried to drive, a pregnant woman tried to drive into HOV lanes. <laughs> saying, since my baby is a person, I get to drive in the carpool lane. Now, I have held a memorial for a miscarriage, and I have baptized a stillborn baby. But these rituals were done at the request of the mother, and that is so very important. When a woman has a deep need for a spiritual recognition of her experience, I will always be willing. <clears throat> but I would think it be unfair for a government or religion to mandate a funeral for every miscarriage or birth rituals for every stillborn. A woman is the one and the only one who has the standing to decide. If one does not hold rituals for miscarriages and make exceptions for rape, incest, or life or health of the mother, then it's hard to argue that human life, with all its rights and privileges, starts at conception. And this concept of pro-life. If one is pro-life, then one should also be against murder and war as well. And the Roman Catholic Church comes closer to this criteria. They allow for self-defense and the defense of others in the case of murder and war. But if the life of a pregnant woman is threatened by the fetus in the womb, is abortion considered justified self-defense? Protestant fundamentalists are often anti-abortion but they also are pro-death penalty and supportive of most American wars. They make the distinction between the innocent life of the unborn and those guilty of crime or terrorism. And, and this idea of innocent life, you know, that when, when does original sin appear in the child? Does it appear at conception or when the child is born? Because if they're innocent, then they mustn't have the original sin. Oh, I could go off into long tangents in that direction. <laughs> Roe v. Wade, which was recently overturned, used viability as the standard. Abortion in the first trimester was an unfettered right, but as the pregnancy progressed, the government was allowed to make more regulations. It was a sense that there's a potential life and a life. 
And as the potential life gets closer to being born, it accrues rights along the way. Many who call themselves pro-life are not pro-life. They are pro-incubator, pro-fetus, pro-pregnancy. They don't supply medical health care for women who are pregnant. And they think that birth control is evil. And they think a woman should face the risk of pregnancy, which can result in death every time she has sex, whether it's consensual or not. The concern seems to be for spreading of male DNA. The a woman is reduced from a person to just a vessel, in a vassal state of male desire. So here we are. Roe versus Wade has been overturned. Those who claim it is a Christian thing to do are not supported by scripture. And even if the Bible did support no abortions, it wouldn't matter because the United States is not a Christian nation. We are not run by Christian law. Jesus says nothing about abortion, but he does forbid divorce. But we don't make divorce against the law in this country. We say divorce is a personal decision that's made for people. A church may say it's immoral, but it's not illegal in our country. So, if your religious convictions and understanding say that abortion is immoral, don't have one. And that goes for you men, too. <laughs> A majority of Americans cannot be allowed to be ruled over by religious zealots. We have work to do before the country becomes a total theocracy. I hope that someone on the federal level will declare that since the morning after pill is federally approved and the post office is a federal agency, that there should be unfettered access to Plan B contraception. Mm -hmm. And I think we should sponsor it in the way that we should, we sponsored vaccinations. And in the same way, we should sponsor vasectomies for any young man that wants to have it because they are reversible. And maybe have young men who want to have a baby, you know, maybe have to go through a waiting period, travel to a far off state, <laughs> <laughs> you know have pictures of all the trouble the kids cause in life and say, do you really want to make this decision? <laughs> Other than think of these wonderful fantasies, what can we actually do? And the, here are recommendations from our state justice uh, group, the UU Justice NC. What we can do is donate to our trusted partner, the Carolina Abortion Fund, to help reduce the financial burdens on North Carolinians accessing abortions and for those people who have to travel to NC, North Carolina, to access abortions. The right still exists in this state, but it doesn't in South Carolina. So we need, to, we need to try to build an infrastructure so that when people come to the state, they can be taken care of and that it's not an undue burden. Another organization is Pro-Choice NC, and that's a, a more of a political organization that keeps an eye on the laws and the stuff that's being done. 
and you can call your members of the General Assembly and tell them to pass House Bill 1119 and Senate Bill 888. Bills currently in the NC House and Senate, respectively, that would codify abortion rights in our state. It's critical that right now our elected officials hear from constituents who want them to protect reproductive rights. We need to be the squeaky wheel. And locally, there is a group of, led by women in their 20s called Warriors for Women. And they've held a couple rallies, and, and, uh, and I know that some of you have attended those. And they also have a Facebook page. And so we can connect with the people who are young women in their 20s who are the people most affected by these laws. We stand in a tradition that trusts humans to make decisions for themselves. We believe in individual freedoms. It amazes me that those who for years have claimed that they want small government I guess they wanted small government so that it would fit inside of a woman so they could control it from there. <laughs> and we just cannot let that be. We cannot let that stand. Let us do all we can to defend the rights of women. May we bless 